Warning, the following podcast contains violent scenes that may be unsettling to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to The Brian Diaries, where the bold crew gets together to talk about subjects dealing with our favorite tabletop role-playing games outside of our actual plays. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, where you'll find our Discord link. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Brian Diaries with our brand new segment, Brian Storming. In it, we will be flexing our creative muscles to put together stories, modules, adventure paths, inspiration for different games, but with a twist, which we'll get into in a little bit. I'm Becca, your host for Brian Storming, and Tillman is my storyteller for today. Tillman, can you explain your storytelling experience for us? Uh, Sure. Well, honestly, going way back, I guess I started with D&D like many people, but it is like 10 years ago and I was never really any good at it. Those were the 3.5 and 4th edition days. Dang, you played 4th ed? I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah. And honestly, that was probably the cause why I stopped. I started with 3.5. The books were already kind of hard to get, but then 4th edition came out and I bought the starter set and I kind of never got warm with it. And then stop playing it. I sold the books by now. So fast forward, I find a humble bundle with Vampire in it, revised edition. I find TCBN. I run Vampire revised and V20 a little bit, but then I don't know how, but I found Eclipse Face and (laughs) I kind of fell in love with it. And I think I have most experience with that, but I've never ever run a, a long campaign. I think. Yeah, you've done a lot of short-term campaigns with us. And I don't remember you ever talking about running at-home games before. Have you done that at all? Oh, yeah. I ran a vampire game that was started in Revised and then quickly transitioned into V20 for almost no reason for whatsoever. I just felt like it. Which is easy. Like, the rules are almost identical, honestly. And that kind of fell apart due to scheduling reasons. (laughs) And yeah, yeah. And that's going to happen with pretty much any group. Like life happens. Yeah. And it's way harder to like actually get all people to come to your house and set everything up and organize dinner or whatever. It's actually so much more work. (laughs) It so is just hosting. Yeah. Yeah. We do that pretty frequently at my place. And it's yeah, there's more to think about if you're hosting and running the game. For sure. Well, cool. So how long have you been thinking up your own stories? I know with the clips phase, you've run some pre-made stories that they have already put out. Yeah, I've ran a few of the, or actually quite a few uh, by now of the one shots that they officially released. I also worked with the, I guess, fan games by Anders Sandberg. Those are pretty well known in the Eclipse Face scene, I'd say. They're also really well made. The problem with both kinds is I found you can just pick them up and run them. And I think that's not just Eclipse Face games. It's a universal thing. Like Chris recently had that issue with a Call of Cthulhu uh, game. So my take on it was always to read the whole thing and then basically write it again. (laughs) Uh, plan out scene by scene what I want to do with this, well, setting that I picked up. But I don't think I ever successfully ran a game that I entirely wrote myself, although I I have like a folder of unfinished stuff, (laughs) like I guess most people who are into role-playing games. I know when you said that, I'm like, oh, I feel that so much right now. (laughs) Like recently I moved and I found a folder like a literal paper folder of Real my old, old school. D- yeah, of my old D and D stuff, and it is um, cringe worthy. <laughs> I was a teenager, and it reads uh, like that. But you know, like we all come from somewhere for sure. Like your early stuff, no matter how old you are, is probably like you'll look back at it ten years later. It's like the the artists who do, hey, take a picture from that you drew five years ago and redraw it again and just like the difference between the two is so huge i mean that's what practice does all right so 
For this round of Brian Starbing, each storyteller participating has been given the same story prompt to work from to create their own story, but they each have to do it for a different system. Now, the storytellers, just so everybody knows, have had time to think about it, so we're not just hashing out a story from scratch in this hour-long Brian Diary segment. All right, so here is the prompt. A local organization is accused of instigating arguments among people, seemingly natural disasters, and even wars. Now, Tillman's writing a story for Eclipse Phase, and you're sitting down at the virtual table at this point with your friends, and you want to run a new game based off of this prompt. Pitch it. Right. So I have to do a lot of explaining about the setting i think so eventually i will get to the story okay okay so just be aware i'll i'll be asking questions too during that great so picture the moon callisto uh, it's a moon of jupiter it is furthest away from jupiter actually it is basically a ball of ice it is very pockmarked there's Many, many craters on it from like meteors that struck it or something else. In the world of Eclipse Phase, Callisto has two settlements. One of them is Gerder and the other one is Hyoden. They are extremely uh, opposed to one another. Let's start with Hyoden. It used to be a research station and then... In the Eclipse Phase world, the fall happened. It is basically the apocalypse. Humanity had to leave Earth behind and it is now uninhabitable. And Hyoden was then flooded with refugees. And they are the kind of refugees that are not very welcome anywhere else. There's many artificial intelligences, like, well, there are people in this society, but they're not very accepted. Uh, anywhere else and there's a lot of uplifts basically smart animals also not very accepted in many places but they get along with one another being outcast basically girder is a well protectorate of the jovian republic the jovians are an odd group in the world of eclipse phase because they reject most of the modern technology in this sci-fi world and the reason is they believe that it is dangerous and that it will lead to another occurrence like the fall, this apocalypse that happened. So with the Jovian, are they just uh, located on Callisto or do they have like other pockets in the solar system that they're in? They are prominent in, well, the Jupiter system. I mean, Jupiter itself is a gas giant, so you can't build settlements there. But they have many uh, stations that orbit Jupiter. Or they have, well, habitats like that of Girder, which are cities on solid moons. Okay. Okay. So it's not just this one one little moon settlement. No, no. We got a whole, yeah, yeah, a nice little region of space, really. In fact, they are very, very established. Like it's, uh, you can't ignore them, really. <laughs> they have the biggest military force in the solar system. Oh, dang. And uh, they do make use of it. They are basically, they're controlling the travel between the inner system, everything that comes between the sun and them and the outer system, everything that is beyond. And uh, they tax all traffic that goes through there. So that's how they stay afloat, basically. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So, so that explains the Jovian republic more i think you're going into more depth with girder did i pronounce that correctly i i don't know but yes. <laughs> fair enough uh, fair i took enough. the name from a book and i'm like mm, is this norwegian i don't know it works it works yeah so the jovians rejecting technology they are not getting along well with Hyoden, the other settlement one reason is they don't like artificial intelligence like at all and Hyoden is a habitat that welcomes artificial intelligence. And the Jovians are also very Catholic and they reject smart animals. They believe that it is basically a front against nature and God's will. Gotcha. So then both kinds of inhabitants of Hyoden are persona non grata. Okay. So, I mean, right there, there's just a lot of tension because 
I mean, I'm imagining that while Jupiter is very, very large, Callisto itself probably isn't that much. So they probably don't have much space between the two different settlements. Yeah, exactly. Now there's a problem for the Jovians though, because Hyoden is full of very smart, reckless people actually. And while they don't have the biggest military force, they have by far the biggest weapons force. They have created the Fenrir morph, which is, well, it's basically like a tank that is controlled directly by humans or like a human mind. You upload your mind into this tank and it is an absolute beast. Think like Metal Gear games or like maybe uh, Gundam fighting or something like that. So is it an actual, like a Gundam suit or is it? So it, it looks, looks like more a like person? a tank. Okay, so it's almost it's literally a, a tank. It's more of a vehicle. Gotcha. Okay, okay. Wow. Gotcha. <laughs> so that that in and of itself would be one of the reasons why uh, Girder wouldn't go after Hyoden. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a tense situation. And that's where my story idea comes in. I felt this had a strong like Cold War uh, vibe to me. And that is something that I wanted to go for. There's like a... There is no um, combat, essentially, but both sides are trying to be better than the other. They are investing heavily into military in very different ways, but they're always trying to be on top of the game. Gotcha. Um, both are trying to get like influence in the rest of the system, and it's a huge standoff, really. It's only a, well, a question of time, really, when someone pulls the trigger. Okay, like someone on either side just oversteps their bounds and then boop, we went yeah, from maybe, Cold War maybe, to Hot War. Yeah, maybe it's a misunderstanding even because, you know, someone misunderstood a, an order or some radar shows something oh. that isn't actually real or is like just a sun flare, or, you know? Yeah, no, there's a lot that could go wrong with that. So, and I noticed you, you mentioned specifically Cold War and that's, I see that's one of the themes that you have for this adventure yeah what a the moon made from ice too <laughs> <laughs> oh it's both literal and figurative i love it <laughs> the story basically writes itself so i would let this game take place on the side of girder which is probably a letdown to some because if you play jovians your choices in character creation are very limited because they are rejecting technology so you're basically playing a regular human. Right. And yet I, I can see this people who don't, um, who've played Eclipse Place before being disappointed with that. But it at the same time, that actually makes it feel like a really good starting place for people who exactly. aren't yeah. as familiar with Eclipse Phase. Because um, there's so much. There's so much. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I kind of thought of this as a one-shot game or an introductory game to a longer story. So now let's get into like the story details. So the players will be workers at a certain research facility. It is outside of the city of Gerder. So you have to essentially take a bus to your workplace. It isn't exactly a bus. It's more like a, a shuttle that can travel over the icy surface and it has a life support system on board so you can breathe mm, until you're at your workplace. Gotcha. Breathing's good. That's always nice. The research site, uh, I called it the Pharaoh Boar site. The backstory is this. As I said, Callisto is mostly ice. There are some like carbon compositions in this ice. Like for real, we could measure that with probes that flew by. And uh, I think there's also like some silicates and simple organic stuff, but it is not that interesting, honestly, uh, from what we know. But there's a, a suspected liquid water ocean on the inside under this ice surface. Right now, we don't know for sure, but for my game, I assume that this ocean exists. So I... in an attempt to do research for the potential of like simple life forms in this water. I said that at the Faro bore site, they drilled a hole through the ice until they reached the liquid. Okay. Is it is the idea for like drinking water or 
experimenting with what's in there? Well, uh, just finding out what's in there, is, uh, I guess. You could take the ice on the surface and like melt it and clean it. It would probably be cheaper than to drill a large hole. <laughs> But yeah, the, the goal was to find life, but unfortunately that turned out to be negative pretty much immediately. No life forms to be detected, but it is a salt-rich water. And in an effort to make Gura more independent, the research facility was then uh, transformed into a well chemical processing plant. And right now it is basically a uranium extraction site. Oh, okay. Now the Cold War aspect comes in. Yeah, just a little bit. Of course, the official story is we are making a venture into nuclear power. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I see why that would be the cover. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good for the people and electricity and heat and... Yeah, you know, this, like you said, it'll make the Jovians <laughs> more independent. Oh, gosh. So then I thought, okay, um, how can we make this interesting? And I decided I want to introduce a group that I called the Jovians for Peace, which is a local activist group that basically does not buy into the story. And they say, this is just a grab for, well, nuclear weapons. It's just another instance of trying to stand up against Hyoden, but Hyoden has never actually attacked us. So even though we are fundamentally opposed to like their ways why don't we come to an agreement and why don't we like stop the this threatening behavior okay so not all the jovians are on the same page when it comes to how do we deal with outside groups so there's some of that tensions inside and i could see that even being a good good thing to post to the players at some point being like hey what do you think about this yeah i uh, would invite players to make their uh, characters conflicted about the in issue uh, eclipse face has uh, motivations for all characters and if you if you follow uh, through with your motivations, like you reach a personal goal, it's it has a positive outcome in game for you. So I would, um, yeah, I would advise players to like think about this backstory and how it reflects in their motivations. Very cool. All right, so we were talking about. I think you were explaining the the plant itself what they were doing there what they're so um you're, you're already kind of setting that first scene yeah right now i think we have potential for many things like this could be a long-running game still oh okay the the basic idea of like gerda versus yoden i've been thinking about that for like a year but uh, oh that's awesome the jovians for peace thing and the pharaoh boar side and so on that's a new idea that i came up with for your prompt because I think that fits in there really well. Yeah, yeah, it really does. So, and that was actually going to be one of my questions later on a little bit was, you know, do you see this as just a short campaign? And, and kind of seeing how you wrote it out, that's where I think you're leaning towards. But I like that you're like, hey, it, it can also be open-ended. You could make it a longer game. And so we'll, like, as we're going through the story itself, because we're still just in the setup and the pitch a bit, we'll, we'll ask how how we can go about doing that. So that is all of the setting. It's a, it's a lot of information for sure. There's so much to Eclipse phase. Uh, let's talk about the the players themselves. What would you, would you make pregens for the group or would you just give them, hey, strong recommendations and guidelines for making their own characters? Well, it's still kind of new with the second edition rule set. Making characters has become much easier, but for absolute first timers, it's still really confusing because there's just a ton of options. Like you, you lose sight of them. So um, if that's what I would end up doing with this story, like pitch it to like absolute newcomers to the game, I think I would make pregens. But uh, if there's some experience with the game, I think I would just say, hey, let's go through this together. The reason why it's simpler is because we're playing Jovians. Um, you don't have that right. many options. Like many things just fall through. 
Yeah. So do you, do you want to go through the list of guidelines for what a player could pick for this particular campaign? So the, I guess the important uh, parts are what kind of person uh, you are and what morph you have. So um, I already mentioned that there is a smart or I guess sapient animals. There are artificial intelligence people that are as uh, smart and as nuanced as humans, but they are, of course, also very regular humans. And that is the option that you will have to take in a Jovian environment. And your morph is the body that you use. And they usually in Eclipse Space come in very many varieties from robotic to, well, animal to completely synthetic or, well, again, regular humans. And I would limit the choices there again to humanoids. I would give some freedom there to choose a morph that is genetically altered to be like cold resistant, for example. I think uh, Jovians would be open to that kind of science. Okay. So, so something that doesn't necessarily push the bounds of what humans can do, but it's still very much, it, it almost sounds like they would have issues with a synthetic biomorph as well as I, I, the mechanical one that you said. Okay. Okay. And then for this game, the, the players would need to have some kind of connection to Pharaoh Boar. Now, yeah, but I think that's very open. You could be a, a guard, you could be a, a simple worker or technician. You uh, could work with electronics or technology or computers, which is a very high qualification in the Jovian environment. You could be a researcher still, medical staff. I think there are many options for like fleshing out your, uh, your character, your personality too. Okay. Yeah, and having having those kinds of options is really good and gives gives the player base a wide variety of skills to pull from so that when we're thinking about like, okay, what kind of challenges do I want to put these players in? We can kind of look at that and be like, oh, do, do they have this covered? So good, good, good. All right, so what is our starting situation? Right, so if you're thinking one-shot context or short story, I would make it an effort to immediately stump in, uh, jump into action. So my starting scene that I would pitch is they are getting ready to board the vehicle that will take them to their workplace, the Pharaoh Boar side. And tension is already high. They're just about to get in. There are several, well, there isn't really a police in the Jovian environment. There's a military police. So there are several guardsmen there that, well, protect the vehicle and protect the workers. And there is a group of activists that try to get uh, in on the side. And there's definitely some, well, some minor violence between them and the guardsmen. I guess they're pushing each other around. Maybe there's some riot gear uh, in action. And basically the activists from the Jovians for Peace, they demand access to the Pharaoh Boar side because it's removed from the city of Gerder. There isn't really any news coverage there, or uh, most of it is, is propaganda. And uh, th these activists, of course, want to know, like, are they for real? Are they really just building power plants or are they actually making nuclear weapons like we think they are? But the workers are essentially left on their own because, well, the activists actually kind of want them on their side. Okay, so you're, you're, they're not having to deal with protesters like throwing throwing stuff at them or trying to attack them at all so they they show up they kind of you paint this scene a little bit without going in necessarily into all that background information that you and i've talked about so far so you know we're just we're plunking the players right in they kind of pick up okay tensions are high and then they go about their day right yeah so they get to work it's pretty much a regular day until basically at some point there is an alarm signal and I would uh, say there is a procedure to like assemble in your team rooms or something, or just assemble in like a general area. Gotcha. Which would conveniently house all of the PCs together. So like, you know, I could see the PCs not necessarily knowing each other well, but maybe they recognize everybody's faces. So it, it would make sense that it wouldn't be a requirement to start off with, hey, you guys are best buds. You know, when you go home, you drink, do whatever Jovians do at the end of a long day. <laughs> 
So, so that's a good way to automatically kind of corral the players PCs to like, we're getting ready that you guys have to start working together. Yeah. So they assemble in some kind of meeting room. And then I would pitch to like one player, maybe, uh, Hey, like your, your coworker, I don't know, your coworker, Frank, <laughs> uh, he, he didn't show up. I would uh, basically like cause some confusion maybe as to what's going on because they are not getting any messages over intercom either. Like it's kind of a dead end situation. Gotcha. So the, the idea would be your procedure says that you must go to this place and then you will receive more instructions, but then more instructions don't come and people aren't who are supposed to be there. Don't end up being there. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. So basically, so, I want to establish the feeling that they're on their own. Gotcha. What would you do if the PCs just kind of sat there and they're like, well, I don't know what to do now. Like, we're in a room, we're doing what we're supposed to do. So how would you get that the action started? Uh, yeah, to up the drama a little that something is, of course, wrong and they need to do something. I would say that then at this moment, there's a screeching sound of sorts over the intercom lovely um, <laughs> and it's my favorite it, noise <laughs> yes and it appears to well mess with them um eclipse face has this concept called basilisk hacks it didn't actually come up with it it is taken from a sci-fi novel of which i forgot the name but the okay. idea is that the titans the dangerous ai that try to wipe wipe out humanity they found like a, s a secret code basically that messes with human brains. Like it's a sense of like impulses over like sound or visuals that kind of override basic functions of your brain and cause like panic at uh, attacks. Or maybe you, uh, uh, you get nauseous and you have to throw up or you like lose control over your limbs for a split second and you fall onto the floor. It sounds like a terrifying trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, mm, would, oh, I just like, as, as you're explaining it, I'm like, that would be so horrific to have to actually experience something like that. Yeah. Like the, uh, the PCs are never forced to like go through with it. There's always the chance that they like withstand it somehow. Maybe it just doesn't work for them because they're slightly different than the titans anticipated them to be maybe they are just very controlled or well trained like their military personnel or something they can withstand a lot of stress um, or maybe they just plug their ears quickly and they don't get the full code so it doesn't work for them so that that actually brings up an interesting point is that something that you would have the players roll for oh and... yeah definitely yeah, yeah. okay there's, there's a rule set for that Gotcha. Now, would, is it just, okay, it happens briefly and then there's no lasting effects? Or, you know, if, if a character happens to fail at it really badly, would they have to deal with something throughout the rest of the, the game? I think if you fail really badly, it will, like, stress you out. Eclipse Face has a system similar to the Sanity system in Call of Cthulhu. Gotcha. You, okay. you accumulate stress and it starts affecting you negatively if you if you're very stressed out. So um, if you get it always sucks in a one shot because especially when you get stress right at the start, it's kind of like the GM telling you you're fucked. <laughs> Have fun. You're in a fun situation. Go yeah. bananas. Oh, that's great. Okay, so yeah, oh, I'm excited to see if there's like any potential further on for more stress because what what it, so you said it's like call of cthulhu where you know the sanity if they get too much stress do they break and something bad happens yes like if you accumulate a little bit of stress um you eventually get traumatized which will affect you so you you can't act as well as you normally would like basically it's a minus to all your dice rolls oh um, and that would suck <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you very stressed out or very traumatized, for example, like in a combat, sit combat situation, you may uh, actually like panic so much that you have to like flee the scene 
or you unable to act, which sucks in a combat situation. If you like, if you're so afraid, like you can't, you can't do anything anymore. It's hard to to play out, but I would always encourage players to do so because it makes the whole game more interesting. I think. Yeah, it gives it it gives it that extra depth. It gives that extra consequences for sure. And I know for I've had players in games where they they unless there's a statistical thing for it, they won't really play it out or they just don't understand it. So yeah, reiterating it and letting them know, hey, you know, think about it like this. And it's not only like good for the game itself, but also just stretching those role-playing chops. Okay, so they just got Basilisk hacked. They either did okay, not so great, or terribly. What happens next? So if one of the players has like knowledge about Titans, which is like a common thing to pick, I guess. Like everyone who went through the fall, they have some sort of memories about how it went down. So I would give the players a chance to like know what was going on. And that would give them the clue, okay, something is fucked up. And we can't trust technology. Like we should probably not use the intercom or something like that. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the next thing that I would like try to establish is that they meet a key NPC. Maybe they meet some co-workers who are equally confused, but then like one who uh, will, will guide them along basically. And this is where it gets more interesting. So uh, the first NPC that I would introduce to them is... <laughs> I choose names that I can't pronounce. <laughs> oh. uh, now, I would introduce Aguila Pereira, and I would picture as a researcher or a chemist at the, at the site. Okay, so this is somebody that either the players could potentially know fairly well, or, oh, I recognize your face... Because you also work here. Okay. Yeah, they, they show up, or she shows up and hones in on the PCs. Is there a specific reason why them and not another group? Probably because they are moving about. Gotcha. Um, okay. They are in the region. I, I, I haven't exactly planned that part out, but I think it would like be something that would come either on a whim or that depends on how the the exact setting turns out to be like when I would actually run this. Gotcha. Well, and actually I think your, your reason rationale for, Hey, they're the only people that are moving around. Maybe everybody else is just, Oh, we must have procedures for this and we just need to sit and wait. But we all know how players can be sometimes that's too boring. (laughs) Let's go, let's go figure out what's going on. Yeah. So Aguila will seem very distressed because she is convinced that there's a titan attack of sorts on this station. Which will work really well, especially if the players made that their their knowledge check. And even if they didn't, they could probably see this as being a plausible explanation for that. So if they, if they missed that role, they can still kind of get the, the extra gap filled in. Yeah. And the... The big problem would, of course, be if the Titans somehow manifest. Like right now, they seem to have control over like the computer system or like the communication, but you can turn it off or something like that. So then the the evil software is useless. So hooray, (laughs) the day is So yeah, that's the plan, right? Yeah, but the problem is this being like a... A research site and the pinnacle of technology for Gerder, they actually, according to Aguila, installed a fabricator there under heavy security. But that is essentially a 3D printer that can make anything like oh, an atomic okay. level. <laughs> oh, fun. Yeah. Fun, fun. So that would be bad if like Titans controlled that thing and they, who knows, make some toxic gas or they create some sort of killing machine or whatever. So it's not, even if they've managed to shut down the station itself, uh, would the fabricator itself be powered, like powered on its own? So the fabricator's the main concern is what Aquila would bring up. So that's how I was reading it in my brain. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair. So 
they can't just turn off the power to the station or what's going on with that? Oh, like the whole station would be bad. I mean, they need like life support systems going and so on. But gotcha. basically, uh, Aguila would press the issue. Hey, we, we need to check on this thing before it's too late. And maybe just destroy it because this is dangerous. Okay. Okay. So she makes the compelling argument, hey, let's go after this because yeah. We fine. can't wait um, for we can't wait for the rescue team, you know. They're gonna take like two hours from Gerder. And I don't know what's going on with the rest of the crew or something. They they seem confused and ill and uh, I really need your help. Something like that. Gotcha. Okay. So really, really selling that point. And if the players haven't come up with a plan themselves then that would be very convincing to go down yeah that's what i'm going for then i'm lacking a, a few details right now but essentially i would pitch a fetch quest of sword or a running around and convincing people kind of thing i would probably establish that for the security uh, in this system uh, in this research station you often have to split up like you you have to have one person at like a key terminal like presses a button and then somewhere else a door opens or something like that so you have to split up in like oh. two groups so you can make it almost in and of itself a, a logic puzzle that the players would have to gosh that totally makes me think of uh, some of the earlier final fantasies probably seven where it's like you have to have the right key cards and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can only open up certain doors Okay, yeah. So that's that would be a good challenge in and of itself. Yeah, and it sells the point why Aguila isn't just going on her own or like something like that. For sure. Because, you know, if she, if she could just get right to it immediately, then yeah. So, so while they're going around doing this and talking to people, figuring out those logic puzzles, which, I mean, I guess you could leave that up to either the players to figure out on their own. Like, that's the fun part of those kind of puzzles. Or if they're having a hard time with it, like, you can always boil it down to rules to give them hints. Mm -hmm. Would there be any other challenges during this particular portion that you would throw at the players? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of unsure right now what I would do with, like, other NPCs. But, I mean, it would make sense to have them meet, like, security guards or whatever other groups that like run about and want to find out what's going on because eventually you don't just like wait it out. But yeah, I think I would use a mixture mixture of like confusion and maybe like uh, the, the guards and the military personnel also not really knowing what to do. They would probably like give orders, but they contradict each other. Like one person tells you to go to place A and then at place A, you have another guard who tells you, you can't be here, go back or something like that. And oh gosh. Basically, I want to sell the point that they are kind of fucked. Like they need to figure this out themselves because, well... They don't really have a, a guideline for how to deal with this kind of situation. Right, right. So yeah, that would be confusing and disorienting. I mean, during so during that process, could the players decide, hey, like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to think through this part right now. Because you the idea is that you'd be selling the idea of the fabricator so well that the players would be motivated to go check that out to make sure that it's safe. But can you see them at any point during this portion deciding that another act road, another action plan would be better? Yeah, so I want to establish that going home is not a good option. So um, the vehicle that they would need to take is like this large bus that is, well, it's basically kind of a spaceship <laughs> in a way because it would travel through vacuum. Like it needs to have a functioning life support system and it's difficult to operate. So also, who do you take with you? And can you really go home to your family when there's a Titan attack? Right. Like, can, you, can you really abandon uh, this place and just say, not my problem? <laughs> okay, so the players can't, really just decide that they're going to leave. Um, yeah. And I mean, and I, I think you were hinting at it, but just like, oh, maybe the life support on the bus isn't working properly because it got attacked as well. So like if they, for whatever reason, were really persistent on that, I like, I could see real like letting them do, okay, well then that's the adventure because the whole point <laughs> is to do this. 
but that could be an interesting if it was a longer term game the consequences of something like that oh yeah definitely i mean then i would like have them be interrogated or something in session two lol right. that'd be fantastic yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so what about like surely there's somebody in charge at the facility what would you say would be going off with that person what if the players go, well, we need to find X, Y, and Z, because that's what our manual says to do in cases of emergency. Yeah, so my idea was that they are split up into various sub-teams or sections of the building, maybe. So the players conveniently are in section A, of course, and then there's other sections. But yeah, that's a good question. We we need to find that guy. Hmm... Maybe I would just use this to guide them to a second important NPC. So if they, for example, say we need to find like the head security guard or something like that, who would probably be responsible for these kinds of situation. Okay. Then I would say they come across, well, my second important NPC, uh, Alexander Siever. Uh, he is a military looking dude. Very heavy set, broad shoulders, short uh, blonde hair. A man on a mission. Ooh, and anybody who looks like they're like walking around determined, like they know what they're doing, that's instantly going to draw, I think, would draw players to that person. This is like, hey, you're not just running around being like, what do we do? You look like you have a plan. What is it? Exactly. So uh, they get to talk to him. And he's even more convinced that the situation is dire and that there is a Titan attack on this boar side. And his his plan is even more, well, outrageous than that of Aguila because he wants to destroy the entire facility. Oh, only destroy it? Yeah, no biggie. Yeah. Because everybody's probably. backed up, right? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> this is the Jovians. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you so, die normally oh, when you're part of the Jovians. I mean, and, and that's in and of itself, like, bam, right there. Wow. <laughs> so that would be the, sh- the short game if they decide to go that route. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, what would, he, what would he do to convince the players that that would be the best case scenario or the best choice? Uh, he would, like, do the military thing like kind of you need to well give this sacrifice now the situation is kind of well without hope but you need to give everything now to keep your family safe and at the town gotcha so that that then gives the players a hard choice do they follow through with that line of reasoning because it's i mean when the titan attack happened originally it was quick and decisive and anything titan related now oh sounds like it would be the same yeah maybe even like put in that thought that maybe we were like digging too deep you know what if uh, oh, like they, they came from uh, beneath the ice or something or maybe the titans were like oh. activated because we created nuclear weapons and there was some resident uh, war machine thing or like that's uh, not okay with that there. yeah exactly dang okay okay i like that the oh just just throwing out that idea of maybe we've we as humanity have gone too far Again. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very jovian thought <laughs> <laughs> so so it would then have even more credence to like well this is kind of what you guys would already be thinking anyways okay so this is you know, where the path kind of splits, right? Because they can either continue to, hey, well, let's try to save this without killing everybody, or they could decide, hey, let's go ahead and kill everybody. So I imagine I imagine the following Alexander would be the shorter path. Do you want to go down that first or the finding the fabricator? So one of the key points that I'm trying to like follow in this, uh, in this story is that I have established multiple NPC who like guide the players. They obviously have some sort of knowledge or information that the players lack. Like they understand the Titans. At least it seems that way. They understand what needs to be done. Now the conflict is, as you already said, who to follow. 
And basically, I want both options to be bad. <laughs> that feels very eclipse phase. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, what are our bad options? So let's say you follow Alexander. He, of course, uh, works in security. He can get you to places quickly. And also, I would establish that Alexander is not convinced by Aguila's plan. So they can not pick both. Gotcha. So they can't just be like, well, let's double check on the fabricator just in case. And then, you know, if it's not, then let's back away and figure out something else. They could, if they really wanted to, split up. Because even though Alexander would, like, try to get them to stop what they're doing, he doesn't have the time. Like, he thinks he needs to do this one thing, blow up the station. Like, he, he can't deal with everything at once. Right. Oh my gosh. Which of course makes me think that this is jumping ahead a little bit, but if the players don't agree with him, combat <laughs> right then and there, <laughs> because if you knew somebody was going to blow up the place that you're in, like you'd have to take care of them first before you move on to the next thing. At least that's what I would assume as a player. Yeah. That, that is an option that I didn't consider. <laughs> <laughs> I, li I like that. Yeah. Like, please don't do that. <laughs> Important NPC has lots of health points. <laughs> I mean, and that's that is a valid way to handle that. Or maybe he's able to slip past a, a security checkpoint that they don't have the right key card for, or you know, however checks and balances that. So if you really want to yeah. avoid combat, that's, and, uh, that's a way if to they, do it. If they're really dead set on it, they could kill him or immobilize him or something. It would work in the story. But I would like emphasize that now they're truly kind of fucked because they killed the head of security like whoops that's that's maybe a bad idea yeah just so okay okay so there would be uh, additional consequences for for that as well again that longer term campaign so but they did they decide okay this is this is the route we're going to go they're following alexander yeah and i guess the the players in alexander could like toss options back and forth on how to go about this in my in my outline, I said that Alexander is going to suggest like doing something with the steam generators. Basically, you can fill in any kind of technology that sounds dangerous, I think. It's kind of a Star Trek thing, like put in a word that sounds dangerous and then they go there and rig it up so it explodes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you just need to use the jargon, right? Yeah. Okay, so would there be any additional challenges after they meet up with Alexander between that point and blowing up the station that they would have to deal with? Yeah, I think at some point things get truly kind of scary. So when they try to make their move to whatever the machine room or something, they meet other uh, workers or whatever who really seem not just confused, but different. Like they they uh, oh. say alien things or they do things that don't make sense in the situation that seem adversarial to, to like the player's agenda. Okay, gotcha. And, and I think you already said it, but that would sell that dire point of what's going on and probably even convince the players that, oh, there's more to this Titan attack than we originally thought. Now, if the if the players went down this road, um, but Aquila, Aquila was still able to make it to the fabricator, like because we haven't quite gotten to to her side of things just yet, would that also play into it, or do you just want to skip to that line of thought yeah? For the basically, moment? my thinking is if they follow Alexander, uh, Aguila still succeeds in the background. Oh, okay. Because she is a Titan sleeper agent in a way. Okay. And I'm using my absolute favorite uh, Titan monster or machine, uh, which is the worm. It's unfortunately, as far as I'm concerned, the only one that isn't like a, a scary looking monster. It's just a person oh. that is infected by some sort of Titan virus. Um, they are psychic, are, as I said, essentially sleeper agents. So something activated Aguila's Titan infection, and she rigged a clay back this basilisk hack at the start that caused everyone to feel dizzy or like throw up or 
uh, over the legs for a short period of time. But her ultimate goal is to more control over the technology. Okay. And hence the the fabricator. Exactly. Um, so what would what would happen? So you said that even if they go with Alexander, she will still succeed. What happens when she succeeds? So she would reprogram the to make a self-replicating nanoswarm, which is like technology that humanity never really mastered. It's kind of alien and you can't exactly understand it. But the way that it works in the story is that black particles like float through the air and they start changing structures around them. And it's going to get uh, really kind of creepy because eventually they are going to like attack humans, melt them together or like cause them immense pain and distress because uh, things are happening to them that they don't understand. Yeah. So then it really becomes all they all the players can do is blow up the blow it up to begin with, because I, I imagine that that's not something that you can really contain. No. <laughs> Okay, so and then knowing that, say the the players decide, hey, we're going to follow this fabricator plan because that is what we need to do. They help her succeed, and then that happens. Yeah, is it just kind of like fade to black at that point? No, they. Uh, I would allow the players to like run away and like try to do something uh, still because Aguila is not that important at that point. Okay, so she's completed her mission and therefore the Titan four sets controlling her no longer cares about her. Yeah, uh, but I would say that it's like, it's difficult to like deactivate the fabricator because at the point where there's like this um, nano swarm moving around, control of a technology is uh, difficult because now um, the nano swarm would just like restructure whatever you've done to the fabricator to like make it work again. Okay, so I can, I can see a couple options if they decided to go down that road. They could still try to find Alexander and help him complete his. Would you put a timer on that? Like if they decide to try their own plan, does Alexander still blow up the station or maybe he's taken out by what's going on with the fabricator so it no longer becomes an option to blow it up? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's always a timer on uh, the game, of course. Uh, eventually, I want to be done. <laughs> but yeah, um, one of the issues I see is that it kind of has run its course by that point. Like You just need to do one more thing. And that's disappointing to me right now, um, but I'm not sure how I would fix that. Because at that point, it's just like blow everything up and that is not a very satisfying solution. So I would like to have like a another option, maybe. Gotcha. Mm. That isn't, you know, it, it'd be hard to come up with something that isn't just a deus ex machina. Like something else comes in and saves you or someone else blows up the station. I mean, that might still happen. I mean, it's... It's possible that at that point they like you could give them an option to at least get out if that's the choice that they want to go with, as opposed to trying to salvage the situation themselves. And then, you know, as their bus is driving away, then we see the Jovians kind of come in and like blow up the station because, hey, something's weird going on. And, you know, last transmission we see received wasn't very good. <laughs> I, I don't know how skeptical they are of of stuff like that so oh very okay so yeah. i mean and then you could even use that as an excuse for the jovians to then launch into oh it was the actually all along it was the i'm trying to remember the name of the other <laughs> yeah the other he, habitat the, yeah the, yeah that, that is of course an option and then kind of thinking more of a long-term game because when I when you showed me your notes and I went over that I'm like okay so at the end of this they're dead <laughs> that was all I had in my brain and I was like well yeah. what would you do for a longer one and you know that that could totally be an option yeah one option that I had in my head but I'm not sure how I would pitch it is so the reason why Alexander is like pressing this issue we need to act now is because it's kind of his job. He's a member of Firewall, like a secret organization that tries to combat, well, the Titans. And he actually isn't truly Jovian. He's just 
acting in their in their environment, but he has backups on Mars, and gotcha. he could uh, maybe establish something that he transmits with some sort of technology that he has smuggled in there, like backups of the players also to Mars. Maybe oh. establish them with firewall or something like that. Or maybe yeah, he has maybe he has like a a secret firewall cell in Girder and he like transfers all their egos there and they get like alternate identities and then they need to establish themselves as basically now illegal citizens right. in Girder and they can't see their families anymore, only from afar. And everyone thinks they're actually dead. That would make a really sad and creepy story. Yeah. It, it would, because uh, a, a way that you could sell that is continuing with that cover-up story so that the Jovians could then attack this other um, settlement. Alexander goes, hey, if you let them know that you survived this, they're coming for you. They will take you out. So it's either you do this or that you die. And at least I gave you the option to live. Yeah. Which is a very Eclipse face thing. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and then and then the players would have to deal with like, oh, I am supposed to be dead right now. That's very against what their beliefs would be. So, oh yeah, it would be interesting to see that kind of role playing as you're going from this into more of the wider realm of Eclipse Phase and and the setting itself. With second edition, I believe they kind of changed the goal of the game compared to first edition. And I didn't really notice at first until I was like pointed towards it. So the original game was pitched as a horror game. And you never really see that. Like it's not played out, it seems. So now the second edition is pitched as a survival game. But okay. I do actually like the first idea more. <laughs> uh, because there's some very like outrageous concepts that you don't find in many other games that you like can live again with all your memories but maybe you are actually kind of a different person because you like transferred your your mind digitally into another body and your original mind died and it's just gone now so yeah like how do you how can you know with certainty that you are still the same person that you were before that event happened. Yeah. And the Jovians, they have doubts about this, which makes them interesting in a game like that. Because in the in the rest of the system, it's kind of established technology and like everybody does it and it's not that interesting anymore. But if gotcha. you're like a, a newcomer to it or a skeptic, I think that can make for interesting storytelling. Yeah. Not like when, when you started pitching it in that realm of it i'm like oh now i'm really intrigued and i can really see this being going from that short okay everybody dies at the end of this to <laughs> it really just opens up the door to asking those kinds of questions and i, I like that we talked that out more because now i want you to run that for us <laughs> <laughs> but you already know the story i i know the story to the start of it that's true yeah i guess i wouldn't be able to play huh or anybody who would listen to this. I guess I need to finish that uh, that text document that I found in my folder of unfinished stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe, maybe. So I do actually just have one more question about the scenario itself. And would the group at all have a chance to figure out what Aquila was before she gets to the fabricator at all? Is that an option that you would throw out to the players? Good question. Maybe yes. I think it could work. I'm not sure exactly how I would pitch it. But I mean, uh, it it could be raising some red flags that she's like conveniently there and knows what to do. And maybe the players get skeptical because she wants to access the fabricator, which is like super restricted. Like you, you don't get to access the fabricator. Gotcha. So maybe okay. they're like, no, we're not going to do this. It has heavy security around it. We're just not going to go there. It doesn't matter. Like it's safe. So at that point, they have kind of outplayed her. As I said, she also has psychic abilities from her Titan infection. So if things get particularly 
bad like maybe they the players gang up on her for some reason because they distrust her uh, she would maybe use that and at that point even if the players don't understand what's going on she would be super suspect and i guess they would like eventually find alexander again that's sus <laughs> <laughs> As, as soon as you said that, I was like, ah, oh, I We have an imposter game. among us. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah, but uh, one thing that I enjoyed about when I wrote this was the idea that both NPCs that they team up with are actually not on their team. Like right. Alexander's uh, maybe acting in their best interest or in like the general best interest, not in their personal ones. Mm-hmm. But he's really not on their team. He's probably actually opposed to many Jovian ideals. He's just there to, well, spy on them and look at what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that's, I love it. Because it's, it's <laughs> right. It's an interesting idea. And again, kind of coming back to that. Hey, let's explore this the society in the context of Eclipse Phase. And, you know, it's so different from everything else. How does it? fit into the solar system. Uh, I like it a lot. I'll, I'm, I don't have any more questions at this point. I'm sure this is a lot for people to think about. Um, <laughs> thank you everybody so much for listening through this very first Brian Storming. I, with this whole project, I really hope that it just encourages you all to be thinking about what you can do with your own games. And thank you Tillman for being the first guinea pig in this. I'm looking forward to doing more rounds, not just of like a one pitch or one story prompt. And then we come up with this. I'm thinking more and we'll definitely, definitely be talking about it later. And I, I hope you guys are exci- as excited as I am to continue and see where this grows. I loved it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Interested in gods, powerful players, and lots of laughs? Then check out Scion, the Valley of the Setting Sun. Our heroes have just come into their powers and must navigate the tangled roots of the Scion community. Will they achieve their destiny, or will their bones be left to dry under the sun?